Sono piaciuti. It's wonderful, it's wonderful, it's wonderful. Good luck, my baby, it's wonderful, it's wonderful, it's wonderful. I dream of you. Chips, chips. Da ti do di do, chi boom, chi boom boom. Da ti do di do, chi boom, chi boom boom. Da ti do di do. Via, via, vieni via con me. Entra in questo amore buio, non perderti per niente al mondo. Via. Hello and welcome to Easy and Elegant. I'm Monica Dalton and so happy you're joining us today. As you know, the show is specifically designed with you in mind to make your life more easy and more elegant. We're lucky enough today to have Joe Dolce, a sommelier, who's going to discuss red wines with us. And we're also lucky enough to be filming at Cafe Allegre in Madison, Connecticut. Chef Silvio is the owner and executive chef of Cafe Allegre, and he also owns Woodwinds Banquet Facility in Branford, Connecticut. This is a Mediterranean restaurant. You can come by six days a week or plan your wedding, banquet, or event at Woodwinds in Branford. I'd like to introduce you now to Joe Dolce, who is going to explain to us red wines, the origins, the tastes, and it will help you find which wine is suited best for your taste. Hello, well, thank Joe. Thank you, Monica. Hi, how are you today? Uh, it's nice to be with you today. Today we're going to be talking about red wines, and uh, I'm a certified sommelier by trade, so my job is really to sort of knock the stuffing out of all of the mystique behind wines and make it more comfortable and make it just a, a more natural thing for people to enjoy on their table because wine is very much food. Uh, when you enjoy wine, it should be with food, it should be on the table, and it's a part of a, a regular meal and it's something that in the United States we're not as accustomed to as being a natural part of the table, but in the old world, in Europe, as we are in an Italian restaurant here, wine is a very natural part of a dinner table. Now, today we're talking about red wines, and I brought three different varietals to try today. We're going to be trying Pinot Noir, Cabernet Sauvignon, and because we're here in an Italian restaurant at Cafe Allegre, we had to bring Sangiovese. So, what I'd like to do is start out by pouring you a little bit of Pinot Noir, and we'll talk about the different grapes. And it'll be nice because you'll get an opportunity to try three different wines today. Now, we have Lauren and Michael with us today joining us that are going to help us out with this. And if I may, I'm just going to start by pouring a Pinot Noir for you. This is Cloudline Pinot Noir. And this particular wine is from the Willamette Valley in Oregon. Um, over the past 20 years, Oregon has become one of the most important regions for Pinot Noir in the world. Um, Pinot Noir is a very challenging grape for winemakers. Um, Andre Teleshev, who was a famous vintner out of California, once said that God made Cabernet Sauvignon and the devil made Pinot Noir. <laughs> Pinot Noir can be rather finicky because it's very difficult to grow. It has all of these challenges in the vineyard that take a lot of attention, but the rewards are so great, it is a grape variety that vintners love. Uh, Pinot Noir is most definitely feminine in character. It has uh, very bright red fruit characters such as cherry, cranberry, pomegranate, um, and it's a very food-friendly wine. Uh, let me grab a glass here, and as we talk about Pinot Noir, talk a little bit about how we taste red wines. Um, you'll always see people swirling red wine or swirling wine. Uh, we swirl wine and we look at the color of the wine as an initial uh, indicator as to what the wine is going to taste like. Um, this, as you can see, has a very light color to it, um, very bright. A healthy wine is going to be bright. If you see a wine that's cloudy or murky in any uh, way, that is suspect. You want a wine to be bright and lively. The other thing we're going to do is when we swirl that wine, we're going to smell it. By swirling the wine, we're releasing volatile acids. It's very simple. There are esters, ethers, and aldehydes in wine, and that's not important to know. But what that does is it brings a bouquet so that we can smell the wine. When you taste wine, 80% of what you taste is what you smell. All we can taste with our tongue is salt, sweet, bitter, and acid. And salt doesn't play in an important way into wine, though in minor ways it does. 
Um, so everything else really is associated with what we actually smell. So let's all smell this and see what you, see, what you get. And one thing is important as we do this together today is don't think about being concerned. Think about what you taste and what, or what you smell. And you know what? It, the sky's the limit because we all have different thresholds of things that we smell. Let's just ask uh, that if Michael and Lauren and I went to a restaurant, would we, wouldn't, I mean, would we look a little strange <laughs> that we asked them to pour it and the words, I mean, I don't see people normally do that, but what you're saying, it seems so much better when you're going to taste it. Right. Well, think about it. The, when you go to a restaurant, the server or the sommelier will walk up with the bottle of wine, present it to you, tell you the vintage, and then they're going to pour you a small taste for your approval. Now this was done originally for the host in medieval times to make sure that one, the wine wasn't poisoned because before the advent of bottles, you didn't have a sealed vessel. It was coming out of a keg or a cask, I should say. Um, and when you're tasting these wines, um, you wanna know that the wine is in good condition. So the host has always poured a small taste to approve for the table before it is poured around. You get into doing this process of the tasting in a very quick fashion, so no one even realizes it. You put your nose into the glass to smell the wine. You want to look for good smells. Mm -hmm. If you smell something that's musty or off, you might want to look at the cork to see if the cork actually has a musty smell. Now, corks will fail on occasion. If you have a true cork in a bottle of wine, three to five bottles out of 100 are going to have cork taint. And that's going to be a smell that's musty. So yes, mm. it's a very large proportion when you really think yeah. about a winery that's that right. produces 100,000 bottles of wine. That's amazing. You've got a lot of wines that actually are potentially bad. Wow. Today in this day and age, we have <laughs> now we synthetic know. corks. We have glass corks. We have things called zorks. We have all of these new, uh, new age ideas of, of how to enclose a bottle of wine. Um, and the cork production in the world is actually getting rather limited. In the 1980s, the American wine boom hit. And when it did, the wine world really grew up with it. European wine regions that didn't really care about doing anything but producing wine to drink, were now looking at it as a very viable, marketable commodity right. for their countries. So especially when we get to Italy and we talk about Italy, Italy didn't care the first thing about selling a bottle of wine to anyone. They made it to drink wine. Today, wine is a very big commodity and it, is, it drives a lot of economies around the world. So Pinot Noir, what do we smell here? I smell black cherry. Black cherry. Cherry is a classic flavor and smell that you will find in it. Mm -hmm. Cherries, raspberries, uh, cranberries, pomegranate, these are all a sense that you will get from Pinot Noir. Now this particular Pinot Noir, Cloudline out of the Willamette Valley, uh, was actually produced by Dreyfus Ashby, which is a corporation that started a winery um, for Druin, uh, which is a European uh, Burgundian concern that went to the Willamette Valley to start producing wines in the United States. Um, they employed Veronique Druin, uh, Druin Boss actually is her name, to be the consulting enologist or consulting winemaker. So this is produced by a French winemaker. Um, this actual wine does not see any oak aging. So this one doesn't have wood influence to it. It's very much driven by the fruit. So the thought of going into a restaurant and doing all of this ritual, it's something that can happen very quickly. They're gonna pour a little bit of the wine for you. You're gonna look at the color. Mm -hmm. You're gonna smell the wine and make sure there's no off taste. And then the best part of it, you're gonna taste the wine. <laughs> They're the best for right? Pinot Noir tends to be very feminine in character, tends to be delicate. Hmm. Now that said, there's a richness to Pinot Noir that's wonderful, uh, but it's not necessarily full and tannic and powerful like we will find in the Cabernet Sauvignons and other grape varieties. This is delicate. It's a wonderful food wine because it's lighter, Light. It's got bright acidity, so not only will it play um, with more delicate uh, food and actually uh, a red wine that will play very well with white meats, with chicken, with pork, uh, with veal. So where you get some heavier red wines that really are driven uh, and really pair best to uh, red meat and such, Pinot Noir tends to be more delicate and seems to have, you know, it has a character that works best um, with a wider variety of food. It also, and Willamette Valley Pinot Noir, one of my favorites, is with salmon. 
fish and red wine do not necessarily go well together. Uh, fish and red wines, and sometimes red wines will make fish taste metallic. In the case of Pinot Noir and salmon, salmon has that very distinctive oily character, that rich, very distinctive flavor. Pinot Noir's acidity cuts through the fattiness in the fish and really provides a beautiful complement to salmon in particular. Now, I, a, you, a French company would go, why would they go instead to Oregon, which I'm very surprised mm -hmm. to hear. Why wouldn't they have gone to California? to some other place, why would they pick Oregon? They do. You know, it was very interesting. Oregon's wine trade is very young. Um, it actually started back in the late 70s, early 80s, where a handful of vintners went to Oregon and planted the Pinot Noir grape, and particularly Pinot Noir and Pinot Gris for the white grape. Uh, they had great success with it, and a handful of wine writers picked up on this and said, this is a region that produces world-class Pinot Noirs. Wow. The Burgundian region, and it's important to understand, Pinot Noir is the grape of Burgundy, France. I'll bring you this bottle of wine here. This is a Gevre Chambertin, which is a red Burgundy. Red Burgundy, by law, must be 100% Pinot Noir. So the vintners in the, Burg in the Burgundy region of France, being that they have the knowledge to produce Pinot Noir properly, looked at Oregon looked at the climate, looked at the soil, and said this is a region yeah, that will produce world-famous yeah. Pinot Noirs. Yeah. Um, so, and Druin was one of the first one, Joseph Druin Winery was one of the first to go to Oregon and start producing Pinot Noirs in the state. And then, because of their success with that, Cloudline was developed uh, through the people that actually started it, uh, through Dreyfus Ashby. When? Uh, this particular wine? Yeah. This particular wine, I believe, was in the mid-90s. So it's, it's fairly recent. Oh, yeah, fairly recent. So the Gevry Chambertin, that's only Pinot Noir, and in this res this wine, you it's have Pinot Noir. It's 100% Pinot Noir. This is 100%? This is 100% Pinot Noir. Then where do you get the black cherry from? I okay, so why do we taste different fruit right. characters in wine? It's a great question. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you know, the funny thing about the wine world is, is that we wine people will stick our nose in a glass and say we smell cherries and apples and peaches and pears, and we never say, my, it smells like grapes. <laughs> what we taste, again, really is dependent on what we smell. And these are all memories, and these are all the fact that one, we have 132 different acids playing upon each other in wine. 132. 132. Wow. So it's a very complex beast. And wine will have all of these different aromatics that come off of it. And again, each taster is going to have a little different threshold as to what they smell and what they taste. Because invariably, what we smell is what we taste. So all of these different flavor components are really a combination of different acids and how our mind perceives what we taste in the glass. There are no cherries in this wine. There are no okay, blackberries. There, okay. there are no other we fruits. It is 100% <laughs> grapes, and that is the case with all wines. That, but in wine, in wine, and you so, start tasting different things. Because when Lauren said black cherry, I was like, "How did I get black? Did they put that in the va that with it?" Yeah. They, so there's no black cherries. There are no other fruits it's mixed all in grape, with the wines but that we're it's tasting. It's just that we happen to smell that from like a memory bank or right. something that we. Okay, that's amazing. Yeah. Now, the other thing that you will get in this wine, or you may get in this wine, because we don't all perceive things the same, is a certain amount of earthiness to the wine. Yes. All wines, the French call it terroir. Terroir is a term that describes wines in the sense that the soil that it comes from, the climate that it comes from, and the environment that this wine comes from. All of that plays in, and you can actually taste a certain minerality, a certain earthiness within a wine, from the region that it comes from. And the soils are very important. These happen to be relatively loamy soils that this wine comes from, but other wines will have chalky soils. Uh, the Rieslings of Germany will have this wonderful slate soil, a lot of granite, and you will get those flavors through the vine in the wine. Yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah. They could go on for like forever about this. Well, it's a, you know, there is this wide spectrum of tastes that we get from wine. What I'd like to do now is pour the Cabernet for you and then keep these in line. We'll taste them side by side because you're going to get to see a different spectrum of flavors as we try different grape varieties and how they're handled differently. Great. This is really amazing. The so second wine that we're going to try today is from Dry Creek Vineyards. A dear old friend of mine, David Stair, started this, oh God, back in the early 70s. This is in Sonoma, California, and this is a Cabernet Sauvignon. 
Just the color is so different. Oh, no. Yeah. Now, many grape varieties start with ancient backgrounds. This particular grape variety, Cabernet Sauvignon, was recently determined, in fact, just as recent as 1994, we determined that Cabernet Sauvignon is actual, uh, actually a clonal variation of a grape called Cabernet Franc and a grape called Sauvignon Blanc. And that this actually occurred, I'm going to pour myself a little here, <laughs> this actually occurred back in the 17th century. And it made its way um, from the south of France because they actually, DNA testing has really changed the way we look at wines. Really? We you, now know. You DNA test a wine? We DNA uh -huh. test grapes all the time. <laughs> now DNA testing has changed the whole thing. Um, with wines, the way you used to determine what a grape variety was, was by the actual shape of the grape clusters and the leaves. So we would look at those, and once they would draw pictures of them, and there are volumes of books that said, this is Merlot because this is what it looks like, this is Cabernet because this is what it looks like. Well, we've been fooled a few times because invariably DNA testing has sort of stirred the pot, and we found out that grape varieties that we thought came from one origin actually came from another. And it wasn't until very recently that we found out that Cabernet Sauvignon is a, uh, a clone of Cabernet Franc and Sauvignon Blanc put together. Wow. Now, Cabernet Sauvignon is the king of red grapes, no question about it, certainly in California and certainly in France. Cabernet is the king. It is the king as Pinot Noir is the fitting queen. If you looked at a grape that was Cabernet and a grape that was uh, Pinot Noir, would you see the difference in the grape? No question about it. The leaves look very much different. Cabernet Sauvignon's berries are slightly larger and much thicker skinned, where Pinot Noir's grapes are, uh, Pinot Noir grapes are much thinner skinned. Now, that thicker skin results in that astringent character that we know as tannin, which maybe we don't know as tannin, but when you taste a, a red wine, and young tasters will always go, oh, it's too dry, it's, I don't, I don't know what that is, that puckering character. That's tannic acid, a very important component in wine. It acts as a preservative. It lends structure to that wine. Um, tannic acid is very prominent in Cabernet Sauvignon grapes because they have very thick skins. You will also get tannic acid from the seeds and the, uh, the stems of the grapes, as well as a little bit from wood aging. Okay. Now, the first wine, the Pinot Noir that we tried, the Cloud Line, had no oak aging, whereas the Cabernet that you're going to try has 18 months in French oak. French oak is very fine-grained and produces wonderful characteristics. You pick up a lot of vanillin and a lot of uh, spicy characteristics from French oak. We use American oak as well, uh, Hungarian oak. There's numerous different types of oak that are used, but French is always the preferred. So the wine is made in California, but you would import an oak tree from France to put the to make the kegs. Actually, the barrels. The barrels. The I barrels. Mean, the barrels, the, the I'm barrels sorry. are the made barrels. in France, and, and it's a cooperage. They they call them coopers. <laughs> um, it's an amazing process <laughs> when they make barrels. <laughs> Shipping the barrels to California. Yeah, yeah they ship the barrels to California, and a, a French oak barrel will cost about. Eight hundred to a thousand dollars. Whoa! Now, do they use it just once, or can they use it multiple times? Typically, you'll get about three years' use out of a, a barrel. Now, a barrel, a wood barrel, does a couple of things for wine. One, it is going to add a certain amount of flavor components. One, vanillin is a very big component, and then two, you'll get these wood spice characteristics, depending on the char of the barrel, because a winemaker will call the cooper, the barrel maker, and say, I want a light toast, a medium toast, a full toast, so that they can actually manipulate the wine by the way they utilize a barrel. So if, if they're going to age the wine, would they, they would age it in the barrels, and if the barrels are Correct. good for three years, you're essentially getting one use out of that barrel. Is that right? Um, well, you'll you actually get three years. You'll get three harvests out of it. Right. Okay. And then it becomes a neutral barrel, and there is okay. still use for neutral barrels. Wine is a living, breathing thing. Wine has the ability that it starts out young, very, in the case of red wines, very purple, very bright acidities, and every day of its life, as every day of our life, it gets older and it changes. <laughs> Slowly but surely, that wine is going to mellow, it's going to soften, the youthful acidity is going to get softer, and you're going to get different characteristics, and then eventually, this wine is going to go from bright purple to a little brick edge around the outside, and the color will change as you see it, and then you'll end up with a wine that invariably gets to the point where it just starts tasting tired, where there's no more acidity and the fruit dries up and all you get is tannin and there's not much to it. 
We never know what day in that wine's life is going to be the best day to drink it. And from you to me, it could be different. Um, but if you had the opportunity to take a wine and taste it every day of its life, there would be that one day where it hit its peak for you. Take a look at the colors of these two wines side by side. Very different. The first indicator that you can see as far as the body of the wine, and I'm going to pour a little more cloud line for you, Mike, <laughs> is that you were thirsty. <laughs> That's all right. That's what it's all about. That's why it's here. It's amazing so, the difference. You can see the color differences yeah. in this. Whereas it's uh, more translucent, the uh, Pinot Noir, yeah. you've got this dark uh, garnet color to the Cabernet Sauvignon. Again, we swirl the wine. And what do you smell? I definitely smell the oak, mm -hmm. a little bit oaky. Yeah. You know what, over the years I've, been, I've done so much wine writing and I always come, try to come up with these crazy terms oh, for it. I've, I, I've, come, <laughs> I've come to the simple term wood spice. Wood, wood spice. spice, I like it's that. It's a nice Good. easy way to say it. Now vanilla is the other thing that I will write individually because you do get a lot of vanilla character. You do, yeah. But the, yeah, and wood spice, you know, uh, the descriptors are cedar, which we don't use cedar, we use oak, but cedar comes out of it and you get these things. Cabernet Sauvignon oh, tends so to different. be more driven by dark fruit characters. So where we have current, excuse me, where we have cherries and raspberries and cranberries and pomegranate here, here we have blackberries and plum and currants. Mm -hmm. Current is very traditional uh, characteristic that you will <coughs> pull out of that wine. And again, there's none of that in here. I was going to say, <laughs> but so, you know, because um, in, a, in languages, la quercia is in Italian means oak. Yep. And uh, when you talk about a quet, like in English, we have, you know, oak trees are solid and they have deep roots, whereas the willow trees, there's even a saying about it, that, uh, about oak trees. So with all the thousands and probably millions of oak trees that mm -hmm. we have in this country, I'm just, you know, just curious if they're taking the grape from Europe and planting it in Oregon and California, et cetera, why wouldn't they use an American oak tree, because we certainly have more than, than they have in France, considering that we're a much, much larger country, right. and definitely have more oak trees, and probably have oak trees as old as their oak trees. Yep. So well, in fact, to a certain extent, we do. Um, what happens is, is that French oak and coopers, uh, what they did was they take their staves, the oak staves, once they cut them, and they lay them out to dry, all right? They leave them in weather, for a period of about two years before they make the barrels. American oak coopers have been taking the oak staves and putting them in kilns and drying them. That difference alone makes a big difference. Makes sure. a big difference. Well, what they were finding was American oak dried in that fashion was giving, imparting a distinctive dill character that was not as pleasant as we wanted it to be in the wine. But they could do the same thing. They could they let are it now, yeah. Now we're seeing American Coopers changing over to this technique, and it's working well. Of course, because we have so many. I was going to say, yeah. yeah. So we are seeing it. American barrels tend to uh, be used more often for uh, spirits productions, bourbon. White oak is very common in bourbon, and they are used for different things. They're used in scotch production and sherry production. Oh, thank you so much, Joe. That was really absolutely amazing. We'll be right back in a few minutes. All right. So the next wine we're going to try today, uh, being here at Cafe Allegre, I could have not come without bringing a Sangiovese. Sangiovese is an Italian grape variety, and I'm going to bring this glass around for you here, Lauren, that is a grape variety that we know best from Chianti. Um, this is from the Tuscany region of Italy, and Sangiovese, uh, translated as Sango, uh, excuse me, Sang, Sang, jo ah. San, Sangue, Sangue de Jove. Yeah, yeah, I knew Sangue de Jove. Sangue de Jove, which is the blood of Jove, who was the son of Jupiter, right? We looked, we you looked and I figured up. that out the last time we were together. We looked it up. Um, Sangiovese is a very versatile grape. It is a grape variety, uh, again, that we know best from the Chianti, uh, the production of Chianti. Now, Chianti is this crazy wine that we know and we remember from the old straw bottles, which were known as fiascos, and it was probably an appropriate name because in those days, the Chianti wasn't all that good. But Chianti is one of these wines that ranges from being very light and simple, everyday wine, to very structured, rich, 
wines that have uh, great lively, uh, you know, a great length and they can develop over a number of years. Sangiovese is the base of that. Now, in the case of all red wines, there's a little bit of blending. With Chianti, they used to blend Sangiovese uh, with a couple of white grape varieties only because they had them and they didn't know what to do with them. Over the years, the laws have changed today to be uh, a Chianti, uh, Sangiovese must be 85% Sangiovese, and then the rest can be blended in with other grape varieties, and that could be Cabernet and Pinot Noir, which weren't allowed previously. Um, so here we are, uh, Sangiovese. Take a look at the color. Sangiovese does not pick up as much color as Cabernet Sauvignon does. It tends to be a little more brick. Notice sort of the orange rim now, around the Is this the yeah. older? Is this a little bit older? No, these are uh, same vintage. This is a 2013. Oh, really? Uh, so it's actually one year younger than the Cabernet oh, that wow. you've tried. The color is yeah, so different. And again, similar characteristics. You're going to look at dark fruit characters here. Mm -hmm. Sangiovese mm -hmm. tends to have a richness to it. Um, That's excellent. You like? I love that because I'm not usually, I must admit, because it's a little too uh, acidy for me, the Chiantis, right. but this is an excellent one. This one, and it's interesting because this one's made to 14% uh, alcohol. It's almost wow. made in an American <laughs> style. And where is this made? It's made uh, in Italy. This is made in Tuscany. Um, Torbrun is uh, done from a larger production facility. But this is a great wine because I like it because it's got really ripe fruit it's components. Really good, isn't it? It's very food friendly uh, and easy drinking. This is, what, this is what I call my pizza and burger wine. I love this bottle of wine. On a, this is a, a not an expensive wine and one that you can enjoy every day of the week. So that's something I'd like to talk to you about because the, our, our audience is now learning about the prices. So the first wine from Oregon, what would that cost? I think this is about a $24 bottle of wine. Okay. And the second bottle of wine was the Cabernet Sauvignon? Around the same range, somewhere from $18 to $20. And the Chianti? The Chianti, this is actually, now this isn't a Chianti, it's Sangiovese itself, but it is the grape juice in Chianti. This is a $10 bottle of wine. Wow. And it's you know, with really wine, good. we need to know one thing. It's an agricultural product, and I can wrap this up very well with this. Wine comes from grapes. Grapes are farmed agricultural products. So that when it really comes down to it, we have noble wines that cost thousands of dollars a bottle. But the name of the game is, is that wine is an agricultural product, and a lot of it has to do with what the market will bear and the quality of the vintner, the region, and the place from where the wine comes from. So it is easy and wonderful to find a great $100 bottle of wine. It is even more enjoyable when you can find a $10 bottle of Absolutely. wine that you can enjoy and that has the characteristics that are similar to those greater wines. Great. Well, I'd like to thank Joe Dolce so much for informing us. Amazing, amazing day. Chef Silvio of Cafe Allegre in Madison, Connecticut, and Lauren Christine and Michael Dugo, who've been wonderful helping us taste the wines. And we look forward to seeing you for our next segment on sparkling wines, soon to be on our channel.